InFi, episode 28. Welcome to InFi, the future of finance, hosted by American economist and author, Dr. Robert Murphy. Each week, tune in for dynamic discussions with business pioneers about emerging trends in finance, life insurance, asset management, technology, and more. Now, let's talk the future of finance. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the InFi Podcast. Today, I'm going to be speaking with economist and my personal friend, David R. Henderson. And we use the R because there's another David Henderson who's also an economist. I know that guy too, but this is the David R. Henderson. And we're talking about UBI, which is universal basic income, and a little bit of the connection to AI, but it's mostly about UBI. I went to find a guest who knows about this topic, and then I realized, oh, yeah, David's written on this. So that's why he's here. Let me give a little bit of his official background just so you can see. This is an important fellow. David R. Henderson is an emeritus professor of economics at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, a research fellow with the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, and a senior fellow with Canada's Fraser Institute. He was previously a senior economist for health policy and for energy policy with President Reagan's Council of Economic Advisors. David's the editor of the Concise Encyclopedia of Economics, And he's also written three other books called The Joy of Freedom, An Economist's Odyssey, Making Great Decisions in Business and Life, that's co-authored with Charles Hooper, and The Essential UCLA School of Economics, co-authored with Stephen Globerman. In addition, he's written over 300 articles for popular publications like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Barron's, and so forth. Also, let me just mention, David, when someone wins the Nobel Prize in Economics, the Wall Street Journal first asked David, hey, do you want to write this up? And they give him, uh, you know, first right of refusal on that. So he's written many of those over the years. He's testified before the House Ways and Means Committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, and the Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources. He's also appeared on C-SPAN, CNN, the Jim Lehrer News Hour, the John Stossel Show, the O'Reilly Factor, the Ingraham Angle, and various other outlets. Born and raised in Canada, he moved to the United States in 1972 to earn his PhD in economics at UCLA and he became a U.S. citizen in April of 1986. So with that illustrious background, here is my discussion with David R. Henderson talking about UBI, which is universal basic income. David, welcome to the InFi podcast. Thank you, Bob. So what we're, you know, I would have prepped people and they can see from the title of this episode, we're going to be talking about UBI, but let's first do big picture so it stands for universal basic income. And so what, what does that mean? Like in, in the context of policy discussions in the United States and Canada, when people throw around the term UBI, what do they have in mind? They have in mind giving everyone an amount roughly equal to ten to $12,000 a year. So often they say $1,000 a month. Sometimes it's 10000 a year, which is 833 a month. And I mean everyone. Well, I don't, okay. So they don't mean babies. Mm-hmm. they often don't mean non-citizens. So you can have a whole lot of green card holders, and I was one mm-hmm. for a number of years who wouldn't get it. But they typically mean U.S. residents either 18 years of age or older or 21 years of age or older. And so then, of course, well, that's what it is, basically. Okay, and so the, so the universal part, like you say, means this isn't just, oh, people who are in financial hardship. Right. It, that, that's what the universal is covering. So, you know, this is just a flat thing, whether you're Bill Gates or a 19-year-old unemployed, you just single mother, either way, they're getting the same dollar amount that's a, quote, basic income. That's right. That's right. It, and that's, by the way, what makes it so expensive. Sh- oh, sure. Obviously. So, but again, just be, uh, to just make sure we understand what the proposal is. Fact. And so... Is the idea that somebody could actually live on that if they had to? Is that what the basic income part means? I don't think so. Because if you think of someone living alone on $1,000 a month, that's kind of hard to do. Mm -hmm. What you could imagine, say, is a few people living together. So let's say you have two people on $1,000 a month tax-free. That's getting a little more plausible. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to have some kind of basic income and, you know, I, it, it, you already asked a good question that I wish I'd asked some of these proponents, which is, well, if you admit it doesn't allow you to just, you know, live on that, 
what's your other plan? And, and I don't know. Okay. So obviously, you know, you and I are, are dubious about this, but let's give it its due. Be, uh, it's not merely left-wing progressives who typically favor, you know, hey, they never met a welfare program they didn't like. But it's even yeah. some of our own colleagues who are, you yes. know, just coming out of the school of free market economics in general. They think government intervention is perhaps unethical, but also counterproductive for the, you know, the ostensible aims. And yet some of those people, even prominent ones, have come out at least in favor of some version of UBI or if there are strings attached. So can you just explain that? you know, that interesting quirk to this conversation, how there are some yes. right-wing libertarian and, and types. Truly, Michael Munger, whom yeah. I'm sure you know, maybe your audience knows, Matt Zorlinski, uh, a philosophy professor at University of San Diego, who probably your audience doesn't know as much about, and an economist, I guess he's, um, he's probably in his late 70s now, Ed Dolan, who has said things in favor of it. And so, yeah, so their argument typically is they want to replace virtually all of the welfare programs th that are thought of as welfare. So, for example, they don't think of Social Security as welfare, typically. Mm -hmm. They want to replace food stamps, housing subsidies, TANF, temporary assistance to needy families, and so on. And then, they, but if you do the, well, we'll get it to the numbers in a, in a few minutes, hopefully, but when you do the numbers, you still have a huge net increase in federal spending. Okay, but, but again, just before we get into the, the numbers, where they're coming from is they're saying, yeah, if we were starting from scratch, maybe we wouldn't propose this to be introduced as a brand new thing. But given the current hodgepodge, and then I know one of the arguments in particular is the incentive effect, that right now, if there's, quote, means-tested government assistance that says, Oh yeah, if you're below a certain income threshold and you have kids, then the government's going to give you, you know, money for women and infant with children, you know, the WIC program, things like that that they had. To, you know, because as a society, there's some single mother with five kids. We don't want the kids to go hungry. She should get, get enough to be able to go buy diapers and formula for the kid. You know that kind of stuff. But then the the problem with that is that sort of locks people into a state of dependency because it, on the margin, if they go out and earn an extra $10,000 a year by taking a, a job or a second job, depending on the situation, if that means their government support gets scaled back, it's almost like they're facing an implicit 60 or 70% income tax on that extra money there. So why would they go do that? Right, so or even this, higher. Even yeah, higher. whatever the numbers may be. But yeah, yeah. so they're, they're just pointing out that there's a weird sort of trap under the current system with means testing that it actually, it's like a, a steep climb to you. You have to make a lot more money in order for your after tax, after government assistance net take home to, to rise a lot. And so for people who, you know, don't have a college degree or whatever, a lot of job experience, they can get stuck in this rut. Whereas the UBI, yes. because it is flat, whether you're Bill Gates or like you say, unemployed 19 year old, y'all get the same number each month. That means, yeah, if you go earn an extra 10000 then, you know, you're just facing normal income tax or whatever. You're not losing out on some of your government benefits. And so the idea is it allows people to, to climb out of a, a temporary downturn. Uh, right. And there's a recent book. It was published in 2022 by Phil Graham, John Early, and that economist at Auburn, whose name I forget, that if they've got some amazing tables in there, that show the first quintile, the, the lowest quintile of households, the second quintile, the third quintile, and how little difference there is in their income when you add not just earned income, which almost no one in the first quintile makes substantially, but also add all the government subsidies, all the government programs. So that makes the point about, these proponents often call it quite accurately a cliff. You know, mm -hmm. where you earn that extra dollar and you kind of fall off the cliff. And so there is a lot to that argument. Okay, so the, the logic from the free market types who are at least tepidly or with, with caveats in support of a UBI are saying, if we could replace all these other programs that are means tested and just get this flat universal program in place, that would be better off because it's their argument is, you know, you're, end up, you're, you're still paying money to the people, but at least with the incentives changed, 
they're more likely to grow out of, you know, the rut they they find themselves in. And so that's right. where they're coming from. Yes. Can yes. I ask you also, is this the same thing as Milton Friedman's negative income tax or is this different? It depends on the version. So okay. Matt Walensky advocates that the subsidy be phased out, phased out once you get past some level, which means it is Milton Friedman's negative income tax. Other people say, no, let's give it to everyone, not phase it out, but just raise income, raise tax rates substantially on basically the middle class and above. Okay, and so for the benefit of people who don't know what Milton, can you just real quickly, what is Milton Friedman's negative income tax? What does that mean? He proposed it in his 1962 book, Capitalism and Freedom. And the idea was he saw these disincentives from welfare, wanted to get rid of welfare and replace it with the negative income tax. So the idea is for some level of income, you actually get. It's funny, I haven't done Friedman's negative income tax in a long time. So That's I'm why just I was asking gonna, you to do it, because same here. Like I was, I was like, you know what, if I try to say off the top of my head, I'm going to get t- t- uh, tangled up. So maybe I'll have David do yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, the basic idea is that for in a low enough income, instead of paying tax, you're going to get a subsidy. And it was never a one for one dollar because he understood the disincentive effects. It was like, okay, you get a subsidy when you have, say, zero income. And then when you make an extra dollar, maybe you lose 20 to 50 cents of the subsidy. And so that's very much like the Zwolinski version where you're phasing out the UBI. Okay, is it something like, I mean, the the numbers he proposed, but something like it's a flat income tax. So like, and and the the standard deduction is $10,000. So every dollar you make above 10,000, you pay 25% to the government, to the IRS. Like that. But then if you owe... If you only make nine thousand dollars, it's not just that your tax liability is zero. It's like, oh no, actually, the IRS now owes you two hundred and fifty dollars. Right. It's something, something like that where it's like this the, like the marginal right. thing you face is just the same implicit tax rate as someone who's paying in. It's just the flip side. If you're below the threshold, then they owe you. Right. Okay. Right. And, and again, right. folks, the 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 reason economists are so interested in this is we worry about incentives. And you don't want there to be a situation where somebody who makes a little bit of money, if they end up and go and triple their income, but they start at a low level because then they forfeit all of like, you know, the Obamacare subsidies for health insurance. And maybe you get breaks. You can stay in public housing if you make below a certain amount. So you qualify for rent subsidies. And there's lots of programs that are available where if you make below a certain level of income and have other qualifying criteria, you get implicit subsidies. And so if those go away when you make more money, for someone who's just getting out of that threshold, it's like you doubled your income and you don't, your lifestyle is exactly the same. And so then why would you right. kill yourself going and getting a job at night and going to night school or whatever? You got five kids at home. Why would you do that right. if it doesn't sell? So that's the issue. Okay. Yes. Right. So yeah. if that's the... Oh, I remember, by yeah. the way, the, the, the name of the third author, Robert Eklund. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of that book. Yeah. And, and I really recommend if you viewers get a chance, they take a look at that book. Or okay, if they just don't to, want to do that, take a look at my review of the book, which I think hits all the highlights. Okay, yeah, well, and we'll link to that, of course, folks, at the show notes page for this episode. And just to be clear, David, they weren't in favor of UBI. They were just talking about the disincentives no. to right. earning more income. They were talking about disincentives. Okay. I mean, they would like to scale back the welfare state in order to have big, better incentives. Right, okay. Okay, so... Given that that's the, you know, the rationale for it, and of course, you know, people who in general want to do more to help. And I've seen in terms of like left-wing progressive types, they like UBI, you know, besides just, oh, giving everyone a basic uh, foundation, but also, oh yeah, there's lots of people right now that work in really distasteful jobs like at McDonald's or whatever, or, you know, people working in Amazon shipping facilities and they have to put diaper, all these crazy stories you hear because they have no recourse. Like right now in our cutthroat society, you got to do that to to live. So if the government gave you this baseline where you could eke out an existence without having to work, that gives you, you're in a much stronger bargaining position as a worker that you don't have to tolerate, you know, inhumane conditions that would force all the employers 
to improve the quality, you know, to get people to be willing to leave their apartment and come work and earn money, things would have to be nicer than they are right now. So I've heard that. Yeah, I think there, I admit, I haven't looked at those arguments in a long time. What mm-hmm. I've been focusing on more mm-hmm. is the arguments that fellow free market economists make for this because I've been trying to talk them out of it. Right, right. Okay. Uh, but so it's been years since I've really mm-hmm. read the people saying what you're okay. saying. So, sure. So yeah. just given that for flavor, so the listeners yeah. here get a sense of yeah. this is kind of how the discussion go. And in a Later, David, I, I do want to get into the AI stuff because that's why this is right. now to had a resurgence right. in popularity. But before we get to the AI issue, just a basic premise. So what I like about your work and why I wanted you to come on for this episode is I know you've actually gone through the numbers. Like for a lot of this, the debates yeah. have just been more like philosophical principles. Like, oh, it's not right that people should get money from the government right. for, just because that's crazy. And you right. know, I don't disagree with that judgment, but you went in and actually just showed, no guys, in terms of the numbers, this just, have you thought this through? Right. And so again, the clean version that various free market economists advocate is getting rid of all programs the federal government has that require you to be below a certain income. And now some people then say that includes Medicaid, other people don't. Uh But even if it includes Medicaid, it would require a substantial increase in taxes. And so the number I came up with, this was back in 2014, it would obviously have to be adjusted. I think I came up with an extra trillion dollars a year, something like that. And so (laughs) that's a large number. And of course, it would be larger now because those were $2,014, and there's been a lot of inflation. And so... Can I just stop you, David, just to make sure the the listeners... So you're saying if you took what their proposal was, so everybody should get this much, you know, per year from the federal government, right? you multiply by how many recipients there would be, and then you subtract out and say, oh, but spending would be lower because we wouldn't have food stamps, we wouldn't have blah, blah, blah. Right. We wouldn't... Even if you included Medicaid, which is generous, since... Some people want to keep Medicaid flowing. You're saying on net, as of 2014 with the proposals, the federal government would end up spending a trillion dollars more per year. Right. Okay. And it's now more than a trillion. Mm -hmm. And so then, I mean, what that means is, so this guy, Matt Zwolinski, recently wrote about it. And his defense was kind of eye-popping to me because he said that a, fi- a $500 per month UBI, which is only 6000 a year, would keep the ratio of U.S. government spending to GDP below Nordic levels, below levels in Scandinavia. Well, a 1000 per month UBI, which is the more typical one, would vault us ahead of Denmark and just behind Finland and France. And it's like, he seems all right with that. Mm -hmm. And that was what was so striking to me. We've got this huge federal deficit, and it's not because taxes have been cut substantially. They've been about 18% of GDP on average since the Korean War. It's because spending has gone up and is now around 24% of GDP. And we're now talking about a huge new spending program when our deficit is 5% to 6% of GDP without that program. That's what strikes me as so weird about this discussion among free market types. And just to be clear, when Zelensky is saying that about like what the impact would be of a a 500 and then you're doubling it to a 1,000, is he building in if we implemented that and then got rid of the other stuff? Yes. So, okay, so then this kind of... Now, I've forgotten whether he gets rid of Medicaid. Okay, but that's the only thing that maybe that's, that's, that you're unsure yeah. of. But for sure, yeah. when he says 500 a month only puts us, you know, it, I forget what you said, behind France or something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Or yeah. In, in the middle of the Nordic country, something like that. Yeah, yeah. That means, yeah. yeah, we go ahead and start paying everybody 500 a month, but we phase out food stamps and WIC and well, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, then, yeah. so this kind of then goes and circles back to the original issue we raised is 
how could they do that? Because, yeah. you know, someone right now who's getting, I mean, for people to intuitively understand the reason this is a problem is right now there's a certain group of people living in the United States who are receiving many thousands of dollars a month in various types of support whether it's literal cash or like subsidy, you know, implicit subsidies, like they charge l- lower rent on public housing than the market would bear if it was, you know, private right. landlord, that kind of stuff. And then instead of that, we're like now saying everybody is going to get the same dollar amount. So you have to reduce the number. Otherwise, the total expenditure goes through the roof. But then if you do it so to keep the numbers manageable, if you dial it down to only 500 a month, well, then now what happens to people, you know, some single mother with three kids, she can't support them on $500 a month. So how right. can you phase out everything else? Like that's not right. going to work. Right. That's right. That's right. And I want to go back to something they don't ever talk about. And I wish I'd talked about it a little more in my 2014, 2015 article. And that is welfare reform because this cliff issue has been understood since before I was a graduate student. Mm-hmm. In other words, these in, implicit tax rates and could be close to 100% that you lose so much, you lose about a, a dollar per dollar you earn past some, past some point. Mm-hmm. And that's why Friedman came up with this thing in the 60s and so on. But in the 90s, there was this bipartisan agreement. This was when Newt Gingrich was in Congress and Clinton was the president. He was doing what he called triangulation and it really was triangulation. And they got together and at first, Clinton didn't like it, but he, he ended up going along with it. Of welfare reform, where you think of welfare as being this temporary thing, so you can't be on it for more than two years in a row, and you can't be on it for five years in the total of your lifetime. And that was why, they, that was their solution. You still have the cliff, but if you've used up, you can think of the five years as being kind of a checking account. Ooh, I better not use it all now because there's a limit. And there were all these predictions of people being out on the street and so on. And welfare reform worked extremely well. And so people said, oh, you know, we got a fairly good economy right now. I'm going to get off welfare, make money. And then I've kept my years of eligibility. Mm -hmm. But bit by bit, the feds and various state governments have undercut that, made it so it doesn't really mean what it was supposed to mean in the mid nineties and so on. But that has to be pointed out because it's not as if people never had a response, a kind of a sensible response in my view to the welfare cliff problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, again, are you, are you comfortable? Because that's the, the thing from my point of view, the issue is, to make the numbers even plausible where this isn't just going to be ridiculous, they have to scale back the, the floor. They can keep it pretty modest. Yeah. But then in that right. case, it's politically impossible. There's no way people are going to go along with really getting rid of all those other means-tested programs because then there are going to be people right now that the amount they get is going to go way down and they're going yeah. to stay with, you know, and then it's, it truly is going to be a situation where somebody isn't going to be able to make ends meet and then, right. so I, so in other words, it's, there's no way that that is going to work politically. Therefore, the, once we open up the floodgates, it's just, this yeah. is going to just be added on top of not a substitute for all the existing programs. Right. And then you think about, and this is an example I've given in, in speech, speeches, you think about, say, four guys who meet each other in college and they aren't particularly ambitious. Mm-hmm. And they live in a fairly low cost part of the country. That's not that hard to find. And if it's a thousand a month, that's 12,000 tax free. That's 48,000. Let's say they're in good health. So they're not worried about health insurance. They can easily rent a four bedroom house somewhere and just play video games all day. Now, would they do that the rest of their life? Probably not. But I think what it would do is delay becoming adults. Uh They might wait till they're 26 or 27 before they say, you know what, guys, I'm sick of this. I'm going to get a job. And so it's just like, I see all these problems that could be substantial problems that I don't see the proponents talking about. Okay. Right. I agree with that too. And then another thing too, in terms of the feedback effect, besides the implausibility 
of just what the proposals are, like at just face value, say this isn't this wouldn't work politically. Why are we even analyzing this? But then for some, you know, if they did impose some version of it, I think also the problem is the feedback loop that okay, once they have to, so given now that even on its own terms, especially in terms of like the progressive leftists who say there's a lot of people working, you know, terrible jobs right now that they could just have the freedom to quit and go, you know, write the yes. great American novel or go back right. to grad school or, you know, whatever. Yeah. At least for a period there, that means there's going to be this extra break, strain on the system. And so middle class and upper income people are clearly going to have to be on net kicking in more to make the whole right. thing work. Right. Uh, and right. so, you know, whether that's literally taxing them more or just piling up more deficit that implicitly, you know, they're the ones on the hook for that if they're the net taxpayers. And so then right. won't that have incentive effects? Like on the right. margin now, won't some people, if they see their tax rate going up and the floor for not having to do anything is more generous now, won't more people who are current middle class people, all of a sudden, won't their reported income go down, right. making the original numbers even less tenable? Right, that's right. Yeah. And then that's why Matt Walensky, the philosopher I mentioned, says, okay, don't raise tax rates that much. Instead, phase out the subsidy. Mm -hmm. But it, then you have the standard incentive problem. And so I took an example recently in, in a blog post I wrote where you phase it out by 25 cents on the dollar. That's like adding 25 percentage points to your marginal tax rate. So if you're even in a 12% a bracket at the federal level, and say a 4% bracket at the state level, that's 16, and then it's 25, you've way more than doubled that modest income person's implicit marginal tax rate, and that's certainly going to affect incentives. The obvious incentives, incentive to work, but also the incentive to make money under the table on which the government collects zero taxes. So, yeah, it just... I don't know. It just is weird to me. Can I tell you a personal story about, I was an advocate of Friedman's thing because Friedman could do no wrong in my view when mm -hmm. I was 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And I went to UCLA, I was 21 and I was TAing a class for an economist named Chuck Baird and he was great. Mm -hmm. And he said, here's my solution to the welfare problem. And he laid out Friedman's negative income tax and he did it really well. And there was this young undergrad, a bunch of us graduate students were becoming friendly with. And he came back to our office afterwards and said, this is great. I wouldn't have to work until I'm like in my mid-20s. And it's like, oh my God, like I literally didn't think of this. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about the woman with a couple of kids mm -hmm. who's not married. And it's like, wow, that was quick. <laughs> and it's like, from then on, I was a skeptic. And mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's always been in my mind. I know it's one story about one person, mm -hmm. but it's such a plausible story about potentially millions and millions of people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then also too, just a weird quirk of Zul Zulinski's attempt to you know, mitigate the problem. It's not a universal basic income anymore if he's phasing it out, right? I mean, that's, that's right. the whole point. That's right. That's right. Well, he would argue, and I, we've got to give him his due, he would argue, yeah, it's not a universal basic income, but people, as during the phase out, if it starts at a certain income level, they're still going to be have, have way more income than the someone who's just getting the UBI. That would be his argument, I think. Okay. I mean, you sh sure. And like, whatever yeah. it is we call the thing that he's suggesting, you know, we got to evaluate it on its merits, but I'm just saying he yeah, is moving away person. from, yeah. it's, right. you know, sort of like, you know, when they first had communism and they had no money and then Lenin was like, okay, yeah, that's not working. Let's have some <laughs> form of money in. <laughs> right. um, okay. So now, David, wh what about the new round of this where I have seen some people say, perhaps plausibly, you know, yeah, you guys are right. But as of 2014, this wouldn't have worked. Just the numbers don't add up and the amount of numbers. Yeah, but yeah. With the rise of AI now, which has the promise of greatly boosting the measured productivity of, you know, human labor and capital right. resources and whatever, like if 
US GDP 20 years from now can be 10 times higher because now we're going to have a bunch of robots guided with chat GPT-9 that can do just so much stuff. It actually, we physically could afford to only have like a smaller portion of the humans working full time. And we could have millions of people sitting in their you know, modest apartments with VR goggles on and they're just living in the metaverse. <laughs> and, you know, we have robots doing most of the stuff and that, that like, so they're saying it kind of, it all fits that we're, we're partly worrying, oh, gee, isn't AI going to throw all these people out of work? Not just blue collar people, but even accountants and lawyers and whatever, yeah, as, yeah. as these AI LLMs get so much more sophisticated. So isn't this a nice thing? And, and you've seen many of these billionaire types coming out in favor of some version of UBI for precisely that reason, like to avoid right. a revolution, among other things. So how do you feel right. about that? Well, let me just tell you, the way you set it up uh -huh. with GDP is 10 times higher right. in real terms. Right. Rarely, I'll, my numbers would be irrelevant. Right. Okay. Because you're taxing with our current tax rates a humongous, to use a technical term, yeah. amount of GDP. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't worked out those numbers, but if it were 10 times higher, say 10 or 15 years from now, that could work. But here's the thing, then wait till we see that right? Mm -hmm. In other words, that's not what's going on now. And by the way, my colleague at Hoover, Kevin Hassett, was on Larry Kudlow's show recently saying, look, you know, the economy is doing pretty well. We are getting reasonable real growth. And he couldn't quite understand why, because you look at all these anti-growth policies that, that Biden has had. And he said, my best guess is it's AI. That Firms are using it and becoming more productive, and, and that's what's going on. But notice that with that AI, what's happened to unemployment? Well, the unemployment rate came up this morning. I think it blipped up. But jobs increased substantially. So there are more people looking for work. And so when you have an unemployment rate that's 4% or less, I mean, when I was in graduate school, we thought of the natural rate of unemployment as being between 4 and 5 mm -hmm. And when the unemployment rate is below the natural rate, then that would suggest that this isn't a problem. So my view is when you think there's going to be a problem, wait until you have the problem. And if you don't get that real big increase in GDP, well, then that means AI wasn't as effective as you thought, which means those people are keeping their jobs. But beyond that, Here's why I'm skeptical about AI causing people to lose jobs. Mm -hmm. It's not that people, that that could be wrong. It's not that that could be right. It's not that that couldn't be right. Okay. It's that we've seen this argument, we've seen this movie before. In 1900, 40% of the U.S. labor force approximately was in agriculture. And... What happened as, ag as agriculture got way more productive, people left agriculture and went into manufacturing. In the late 50s, the biggest percent of the labor force, manufacturing employment as a percent of the labor force was at its peak. Then as manufacturing got way more productive, we lost jobs in manufacturing. What did they go into? Services. And so... That's why it's just so hard to believe that somehow this time would be different. Could it be different? Yes, it could. I don't think it will be. But again, if it will be, and we get this huge increase in productivity, then let's talk about some kind of UBI then. But not now. Not now when we're looking at potential $2 trillion deficits or very close to for the next number of years when we've got Social Security who President Biden assured us last night he's not going to change. Um, when we've, we've got, that's going to hit a cliff of a different sort in 2033. That's not a long way off. You know, why do this now? Okay, let me just see if I can repeat back the main points of what you just said. So yeah. on the one hand, just tackling the, the claim that's sort of taken as a given among in certain quarters that, oh yeah, AI is cool and it's going to, you know, it's making leaps and bounds in terms of productivity. But ah, shoot, the downside is it's going to throw a lot of people out of work. And what are we going to do with these billions of unemployable people? And you're yeah. saying, 
the, as an economist, you don't think that's correct, or at least people need to give you more reason as to why is that true this time? Because historically, every time there's been major innovations in the economy, it has changed the distribution of where the labor force is. And right. yeah, originally back in the 1800s, most of the U.S. labor force was in ag- or a lot of it was in agriculture, and then that shrunk, and it's fewer and fewer people were needed to harvest more and more food. You know, right. it's, it's not the U.S. agricultural output went down. It's just we got so much more efficient using tractors and fertilizers and all this stuff that you needed fewer people. And, you know, that had been a mainstay. Like, people, oh, the family, you know, the American farmer, and this is a great Thomas Jefferson, and da, da, da. And yeah. then they, you know, <laughs> but as of the 1950s, the big thing was manufacturing. And, oh, yeah, the mark of a strong country was do you produce a bunch of stuff in factories? And right. then in America, you know, was great in that. And then over time, the number of Americans in manufacturing went down. And so again- As manufacturing same, output went up, yes. by the way. Yes. yes. It's yeah. the same kind of pattern. And then now we're yeah. like, oh yeah, we have all these sophisticated people in, uh, you know, IT and this, you know, legal services and accountants and all these white collar workers are going to get thrown out of work by the AI. What are they going to do? And your point is they're going to do something Right. And then, you know, it'll just be sort of, so it's like, yeah, the machines now can do things to free up human labor to go do something else. So it's an and, it's not a, an either or. Right. Right. Yes. And by the way, to give the, to look at manufacturing a minute, the last time I checked, I think our manufacturing output in real terms was seven, bo- 7% below its peak. It's peak ever. And so this idea we don't produce things anymore is nonsense. We do. It's just we do it very, very efficiently. Yep. Okay. And then the other thing you were saying is even if the argument is true that this time really is different, you're saying, well, right, it's not like unemployment's 10% right now. Historically, we have very low unemployment. So if it is the case that these AIs are going to throw a bunch of people out of work, but by boosting overall productivity such that we have a bigger pie that we could afford to just give these people enough to live on even though they're not working. Right. Well, let's, wait till we're, be, let's wait yeah. till we're in that situation before we do that. Because right now, we don't have this extra huge pie to give to people and they're not being thrown out of work because the unemployment rate is right. so low. And, right. And you mentioned about billionaires advocating this. And I think that's interesting too because I think, I know a few billionaires. Well, I know Charles Koch. And I don't think he's subject to this problem, but many billionaires I read about, I read what they say, the Mark Cubans of the world and so on. I think because they've been wealthy for so long, they've kind of lost touch with, you know, with some of these issues. Like, Mm. and I even see it in my own life. Like we're putting our wills together and I realize I literally have don't ever have to work again in my life. I still want to, but I don't have to. Uh-huh. And it's, I'm, and so people's grocery bills go up and I hear lower income friends talking about it and I'm not even aware of it. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> you know, okay, we want that, we buy it. And I still have, I'm still saving each month right, right. Um, out of my freelance income. And so, you know, I just think we're less sensitive we, yeah, I'm counting myself with billionaires. You and the billionaires, yeah, you and Elon. <laughs> yeah, we're less sensitive to those things, and I think it can give them a sense of reality. I think what keeps me grounded is I'm not that far from it. I have, an, uh, you know, neighbors who are in very different, uh, you know, in mm. much more modest circumstances than I am, and I talk to them. And so it's just, it just, there's an air of unreality often that comes out of billionaires. Well, also, too, I wonder if some of it is, and I'm not questioning anybody's sincerity. Like it, it might be, right. but there's a, is a sort of thing that if you're a billionaire, especially if you own a company and you're going to be like mass producing these robots and whatever that might throw people out of work, it's pretty good PR for you to say, oh, I, I'm happy to be taxed extra to pay. Yeah, You know what I mean? Like yeah. in other words, if they're looking ahead and saying, oh yeah, if I'm at that point a, a quadrillionaire, and I have thousands, you know, millions of robots that do most of the manual yeah. tasks on planet Earth, and they grow the food and build the apartment complexes and maintain, yeah. you know, the data centers for all the VR stuff. That yeah, yeah. I'm happy to give a, a portion of that to support all the millions of people who now just sit in their apartments downloading content all day. Sure, 
Right, and, right. You know, because that's how benevolent I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, right, otherwise, right, right. people might want to come and take my fortune from me if they think that yeah, I'm going to ruin yeah. society. So I can see there'd be an element of that. Yeah. And the other thing is people's wants expand with what's available. And so there's this idea, you know, that there's no real minimum that people will just, they'll just say, okay, I'm fine with that. And I think back to a, an essay by John Maynard Keynes, you're probably familiar with about the economic possibilities for our grandchildren, something like that. Oh, yeah. In which he said it with this kind of growth rate that was plausible, and it was plausible, it kind of did happen. Mm -hmm. People wouldn't have to work more than 15 hours a week. Well, yeah. If what they wanted was the consumption bundle that people had in the 1940s. Right. But we want our widescreen TVs. Okay, here's another change in my adult life. When I was in my 20s and someone got married, there was a bachelor party at someone's place. And if they sprung for it, this was not my taste. They had a stripper. Okay? Mm -hmm. Not what I wanted, but that was their, their deal. Now, people have destination bachelor parties because they can fly to Vegas mm -hmm. or in, if they live in Boston, they flew to Montreal and so on. And it's like, that just shows people want more. And I'm not blaming them. Good for them. But it's just like, there are all these things we want and that minimum won't do it. It won't come close. I can remember the, uh, going along with what you're saying, my first vehicle that my parents got me was a Ford Ranger. And it didn't have air conditioning, but I was in upstate New York. And I was like, yeah, if it's yeah. in the summer, I just drive with the windows down. You know, yes. problem solved. Right. And now I can't imagine not having air conditioning in my car. Like that would be inconceivable. Right. right. And I'm, yeah, and, and you're substantially younger than me, but I lived in Rochester where you grew up. Mm -hmm. And my first car, which was a lemon, was a 1975 Volkswagen Rabbit. And it, it didn't, if I recall, I don't think it had air conditioning. I don't think. Anyway, so yeah, things have just gotten, things have gotten better. And by the way, when I rolled the window down, I had to do this with my arm. Yeah, right. <laughs> was, Ditto. Ditto. <laughs> and we liked it. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. uh, we just look at the clock here. We just got a few minutes. So as we're recording this, folks, the State of the Union was last night. So what's your, any final thoughts for the listeners and, and your uh, view of the future of America and, you know, I guess the world at large? Well, I didn't watch it. I recorded it in case, I always record them in case I hear something I want to just see for myself. Right. Did he really say that? Did other people really react that way? And I'm, so I'm not there yet. And I might not watch it unless I find something I really want to check. But, uh, okay, so you've known me a long time, Bob, and so you know I'm a kind of a glass half full person, mm -hmm. right? I'm a, an optimist. My optimism is fairly low for me. Mm -hmm. It's still higher than most people's, okay. than the average. And it's because I just see all these things that have gotten better, whether it be in healthcare, in what we were talking about with cars and, and so on. And so, you know, if Biden gets reelected, will we still have economic growth? Yes. If Trump gets elected, will we still have economic growth? Yes. Which one would be higher? I think Trump, but I'm not sure because I'm not sure how serious he is about those tariffs and so on. But anyway, so I just, I think we will have economic growth. Now, if we could just get rid of a whole lot of regulation that are slowing things down, we could have more economic growth. I, I was visiting with some people at coffee yesterday morning and we live in coastal California where there's a lot of regulation and we we're talking about, well, can I replace my deck, you know, without getting a permit? Oh no, you got to get a permit. And it's the same deck, you know? Mm -hmm. And this guy went to, I talked about his thing he's building for his retirement and the soil person who has to come out can't come out till a year from now to look at it. And so if we could just get rid of a lot of those regulations, we would be way better off. Well, I think that's uh, something to shoot for. So my guest has been David Henderson. David, thanks so much for your time and your insights. Thanks, Bob. Thank you everyone for tuning in and don't let those 
AIs take your job. We'll see you next time. <laughs> This concludes another episode of InFi, The Future of Finance with Dr. Robert Murphy. The information provided is for educational purposes and does not constitute financial advice. Consult with qualified professionals before making any financial or investment decisions. For more information on the host and for previous episodes, visit infithefutureoffinance.io. Thanks for listening.